Alien species, who's watching us? For several decades, men and women from all over the world would have come into contact with entities from other worlds, the so-called close encounters. However, these encounters would not always be with a single extraterrestrial race, but with many races of the most variegated shapes and sizes. In our mass imagination, we are used to aliens being represented as skeletal beings with grey skin and a large oval head. These would be the so-called greys that entered into our imagination for the first time thanks to the alleged UFO crash in Roswell, New Mexico. Over the years, however, there have been many alleged contacts with different types of creatures or entities, many of which have been classified by ufologists. Brad Steiger's classification is the one used most by ufologists, which divides the humanoids into four categories, using the first four letters of the Greek alphabet, namely Alpha, Beta, Gamma and Delta. Only the greys would be included in the Alpha type category. The greys are completely hairless, their mouth is a slit, their nose is just stylized, while their ears are two holes. They have long, oval, oriental-shaped eyes, which are often protected by black contact lenses. They would also possess mental powers, which they use to communicate with abductees telepathically. Beta-type beings are almost identical to humans, with typically Nordic traits. They could live peacefully among us without ever being discovered. The Gammas are associated with creatures typical of human folklore, such as Bigfoot or Sasquatch, and Yetis. According to Steiger, these creatures would be nothing more than automatons sent from space to collect samples of terrestrial fauna and flora for unknown cosmic purposes. And finally, the Delta types, where we can find all beings with animal characteristics, such as the Mothmen, the Insectoids and the Reptilians. The first alien species we are going to talk about has been sighted only once, and therefore represents an isolated but no less fascinating case. At 7.15pm on September the 12th, 1952, two brothers, Edward and Fred May, and their friend Tommy Heyer, were walking in the countryside just outside of Flatwoods, a town in Brixton County, West Virginia. Suddenly, the three boys looked up and saw a luminous object cross the sky, which then seemed to plummet into the land belonging to farmer G. Bailey Fisher. The two frightened brothers ran to tell their mother, Kathleen, what had happened. They told her they had seen a flying saucer crash to the ground. Mrs. May, curious, decided to check with her own eyes if her children were telling the truth or not. Kathleen, accompanied by Neil Nunley, Ronnie Shaver, her children and their friend Tommy, together with a West Virginia National Guardsman, 17-year-old Eugene Jean Lemon, headed to the Fisher farm to identify what the object the boys had seen was. When they reached the farm, the sun had already set, and Lemon's dog suddenly set off and ran for a few dozens of metres, barking into the dark, and then he ran in terror from the group, moments later. After about half a mile, the seven reached the top of the hill, where they reported seeing a pulsating fireball. In addition, there was a pungent mist in the air that made their eyes and noses burn. Lemon then noticed two small lights to the left of the object, under a nearby oak tree, and aimed his flashlight in that direction. The light revealed something that would mark their lives forever, namely a terrifying creature with an elongated head and large red eyes. As soon as it realised it was being watched, it emitted a sharp and sinister hiss, then began to move towards them at great speed. 
At this point, in a panic, all seven of them fled, running as fast as they could without ever looking back. Returning safely home, Kathleen May contacted local sheriff Robert Carr and local newspaper co-owner A. Lee Stewart. The woman told them what had happened in detail, intriguing the young journalist, who that same night conducted a series of interviews and visited the site of the incident with Agent Lemon. A. Lee Stewart also reported the presence of a metallic odour that was quite nauseating, a detail also confirmed by Sheriff Carr and his deputy Burnell. However, the two reported that they had not found any concrete evidence in favour of the story told by Mrs May. The next morning, Stewart returned once again to the alleged meeting place and discovered two long tracks in the mud and remains of a thick black liquid near the tree where the creature had been seen. The journalist reported them as possible signs of a landing, assuming that the area had been traffic-free for at least a year. However, the tracks were later found to be most likely made by a 1942 Chevrolet pickup truck, owned by a local man, Max Lockhart, who had travelled to the site to look for the creature, hours before Stewart's discovery. After the event, William and Donna Smith, associated with the Civilian Saucer Investigation Group, discovered other sightings by witnesses who reported having similar experiences. These included the story of a mother and her 21-year-old daughter, who claimed they had encountered a creature that looked and smelled the same a week before the September the 12th incident. The mother reported that her daughter was so frightened that she was forced to stay in Clarksburg Hospital for three weeks. They also reported the statement of Lemon's mother, who said that she felt her house shaking shortly after the incident and that her radio didn't work for 45 minutes. The local director of the Board of Education also claimed to have seen an unidentified flying object at 6.30am on September the 13th. After encountering the creature, some members of the September 12th group reported suffering very similar symptoms that persisted for some time, attributing them to being exposed to the mist emitted by the monster. The symptoms included irritation of the nose and a burning sensation of the throat, while Lemon suffered from vomiting and seizures throughout the night following the sighting and had throat problems for the following weeks. One doctor reported the symptoms as similar to those caused by tear gas, symptoms that are also common in those suffering from hysteria due to a shocking and traumatic event. As for the creature's appearance, the descriptions of the alleged witnesses vary, but most agree that it was at least seven feet tall with a black body, a dark red face and two large bright red eyes. Some described the head as being elongated, resembling the shape of a diamond. Behind its head, it had a kind of fairing, and it seemed to be wearing a dark pleated exoskeleton, later described as a kind of shadow. Its arms were long, as were its clawed fingers. All these, to say the least, chilling characteristics, led it to being nicknamed the Flatwoods Monster, a true American legend. We mustn't forget, however, that the incident generated a lot of scepticism. Examining the case 48 years after the events, Joe Nickel of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, known as PSYCOP, concluded in 2000 that the light seen on September the 12th by the children was probably a meteor, and the creature could have been confused with a large owl. According to Nickel, both the sighting of the UFO in the sky and the encounter with the creature were events created by mass hysteria. In short, the version of natural events was distorted by the strong feelings of anxiety felt by multiple observers. However, even today the legend of the Flatwoods monster is handed down from generation to generation, rightfully taking its place in West Virginian folklore.
but another, much more famous creature than the Flatwoods Monster has entered American folklore, becoming a symbol in mass culture. This entity of unknown origins, for some it would even be able to predict the future, would act as a sort of guardian angel of humanity. We are talking about the Mothman, the winged monster of Point Pleasant. Late at night on November the 15th, 1966, two young married couples, Roger and Linda Scarberry and Stephen Mary Mallette, drove by an abandoned Second World War explosives factory. The structure, known as Area TNT, was located a few miles from Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Suddenly they noticed two red lights in the dark, inside an old building next to the factory generator. So they decided to stop the car to better see what it was. They got out of the vehicle and to their amazement they realised that the lights were bright red eyes belonging to a large animal similar in shape to a man but larger, about six or seven feet in height, with large wings folded against its back. To the eyes of the four of them it looked like a giant bat. The four of them, terrified, immediately returned to their car and drove off at high speed down Highway 62. During the journey, to their terrible astonishment, they saw the creature once again, standing on a hill beside the road. The being was following them. The car was travelling at 90 miles per hour, but without any problem, the Mothman reached it and flew alongside it. It peered inside, observing the terrified faces of the four. Its huge eyes, as red as fire, remained fixed on the two young couples for a few moments, until, by now the car having reached the outskirts of town, the being flew away, camouflaging itself in the dark and disappearing into the night. Later, after informing the local authorities, Scarberry returned to the area, but no trace of the strange being was ever found. The story quickly spread throughout Point Pleasant, so the next night, November the 16th, some local citizens, equipped with guns and rifles, began looking for signs and traces of the creature in the area surrounding the old factory. But, as often happens, this unusual hunting trip brought no results. In fact, while the entire town focused its search in the old TNT area, Mr. and Mrs. Wamsley and Mrs. Marcella Bennett, with her daughter and son, set off by car to visit Mr. and Mrs. Thomas, their great friends. The Thomases lived in a bungalow at Igloo, an area filled with dome structures erected for the storage of explosives during the Second World War, near the same industrial area where the sighting had taken place the previous night. Arriving at their friend's home, the Wamsleys noticed a mysterious figure appear behind them. It was a large, greyish being with red eyes emitting light. It was intent on looking for something on the ground and was not interested in the people who were watching it nearby, paralysed in fear. Running inside the bungalow, Mr Wamsley immediately telephoned the police. The Thomases turned off the lights and decided to hide, trying to make as little noise as possible. In total silence, the creature's eyes emanated a fiery red light, which illuminated the entire living room through the central window. Step by step, the being reached the porch of the house and peered inside, to then take off and disappear into the sky, as it had done the previous evening. When the police arrived, they made their report. The press wrote articles about the second sighting of the being that was then nicknamed Mothman, and from that moment on, the reports of close encounters increased exponentially. Later, on November the 24th, four county officers spotted a similar creature flying over the TNT area. On the morning of November the 25th, a certain Thomas Urey reported that he had noticed a creature, similar to the one reported the previous day, standing in a field by the side of the road as he headed north along Route 62 near the TNT area. 
The being spread its wings and started flying, chasing Yuri's car. Thomas, petrified, accelerated and managed to lose the creature, and reaching the city, he decided to inform the local sheriff of what had happened. On November the 27th, Mrs. Ruth Foster in the West Virginia suburb of Charleston saw a grey creature with bright red eyes, taller than a man, standing on the lawn of her home near the Auburn State Highway. The being disappeared as soon as Mrs. Foster went out to get a better look. On the morning of the same day, a winged creature with a humanoid appearance pursued a young woman named Mason, also in West Virginia, while that night, a similar being was seen near the Auburn State Highway by two children. Finally, a group of five men, intent on preparing a grave in a cemetery near Clendenin, also claimed to have seen a brown human figure with wings rising into the air from nearby trees. This particular sighting was dated November the 12th, thus becoming the first alleged sighting, but was not immediately reported, as the group of five gathered their courage to talk about the incident only after hearing the countless reports of sightings that had taken place in the area. The name Mothman was attributed to the creature following the first incident reported to the press. When a reporter from the local newspaper, in the title of his article, referred to the monster as the Mothman who terrorises Point Pleasant, the creature has since become a protagonist of new American mythology. From the various witness accounts, the descriptions of the creature's appearance are all substantially similar. They speak of a being about six feet tall, with very large, fiery red eyes, endowed with their own luminosity. The humanoid being possessed human limbs. In fact, it was sighted several times in upright postures, and there were numerous descriptions that spoke of long arms with clawed hands. Its wings, similar in appearance to those of a moth, were seen folded against its back when not in use, while reaching a wingspan of nine feet when used in flight. It was reported by several witnesses how the being flew keeping its wings rigid without beating them, a characteristic similar to the flight of birds of prey or owls, while the speed of the creature reached 90 miles per hour without too many problems. This was reported by several witnesses. As we have already seen, the Mothman was able to follow cars moving at high speed. And finally, the strangest detail of all, the sound that the creature emitted. In fact, according to some witnesses, the being emitted a metallic sound when it moved. In the course of one year, there were more than 100 sightings near Point Pleasant, but Everything came to an abrupt end on December the 15th, 1967, when the town was hit by a tragic and unexpected event. It was rush hour and several cars were driving along Silver Bridge, a suspension bridge over the Ohio River that connected Point Pleasant with Gallipolis. Suddenly, a loud metallic thud rang out in the area, and the inhabitants of the two towns, petrified with fear, witnessed Silver Bridge writhe and finally break in two, collapsing into the river. 46 people died that day, guilty only of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Subsequent investigations set up to shed light on the incident concluded that the collapse was caused by the defect of one of the eye bars, joined by relative bearings, of the load-bearing plates acting as tie rods, which differed by 0.1 inch in diameter due to corrosion, but it was also due to the poor management of the bridge itself, which was designed to carry lighter loads than those allowed. A not negligible fact was the use of poor quality materials in the building of the bridge, which already had residual stress, which over time compromised its resistance to stress corrosion cracking. In response to critics who said that the accident could have been avoided, the authorities concluded that in order to discover internal damage to the eye bar, a proper internal inspection analysis of the material in question should have been performed by dissembling it to find the crack, which, based on the technologies of the time, was not possible to do. This tragedy was later linked to the legend of Mothman, 
as the creature was allegedly seen several times, flying over the bridge during the previous months, and some witnesses even said they saw the creature resting on the towers of the Silver Bridge during the night. These stories led to the idea that the Mothman was a harbinger of doom, a messenger trying to warn of impending disaster, or simply an observer of human events. A version of the facts was made popular by the journalist and ufologist John A. Keel, who in 1975 wrote The Mothman Prophecies, where he collected his research on Point Pleasant sightings, also linking them to a wider model of phenomena concerning UFOs, flying men, men in black, Native American thunderbirds, the bird-like Garudas of Buddhist and Hindu tradition, and even ghosts. Keel hypothesized that the Mothman was an ultra-terrestrial, that is, a being not from outer space, but from a reality slightly out of alignment with our own. But that of the Flatwoods Monster and the Mothman were not the only evidence of ultra-terrestrial or extraterrestrial activity in the West Virginia area. It is strange to discover that in the same period of time, a few dozens of miles from Point Pleasant and Flatwoods, a new alien race became known, with an appearance similar to that of a normal human being, except for one disturbing detail. In 1966, Woodrow Derenberger was a sewing machine salesman living in Mineral Wells, West Virginia. One November night, Derenberger was returning home from a business trip to Marietta, Ohio. On the road, he saw lights in the distance, and thinking it was a police car, he decided to stop. But he soon discovers that those lights belonged to an unusually shaped craft, which Derenberger would later describe as an old-fashioned kerosene lamp chimney, flared at both ends, narrowing to a small neck and then widening with a large bulge in the centre. From inside the craft, a man emerged through a hatch. He had slightly elongated eyes with slicked back dark brown hair and deeply tanned skin. He wore reflective blue clothes and his face was twisted into a wide grin. He was smiling, but in a way that was impossible for any human. The opening of his mouth was almost ear to ear. An exceptional meeting that Woodrow told of in an interview with Ronald Maines at a local TV station. These are his words. He looked perfectly natural and normal as any human being. His face looked like he had a good tan, a deep suntan. He was not too dark, but it was just like he had been out in the sun a lot and had a good tan. His hair was combed straight back and it was dark brown and he seemed to have a good thick head of hair. His eyebrows, his face, his features were very normal. I don't believe that he looked any different from any other man that you would meet on the street. But one thing was really unusual. He had a big smile and kept his arms crossed with his hands under his armpits. And though he spoke to me, his smile never wavered. He spoke telepathically. He asked me to roll down the window on the right side of my truck and I did as he asked. And this man stood there, and first he asked me my name, and I told him my name, and then he asked, Why are you scared? Then he said to me, Don't be afraid. We wish you no harm. We mean you no harm. We just wish you happiness. And I told him my name, and when I asked his, he said his name was Cold. Indrid Cold. Derenberger reported everything to the police and the story went off like a bomb in the hands of the agents. Local newspapers and TV went wild, and the story soon became famous across the United States. After Derenberger's interview, naturally many people came forward, claiming that they had met this mysterious Indrid Cold. For example, a few days later, a man said he had had a close encounter with Indrid Cold. The strange figure corresponded to the identikit provided, a man with an anomalous stretched smile who would have emerged along the edge of an isolated road and would have tried to stop the witness's car, who, observing the strange features of the mysterious man, panicked and drove off at great speed. And later, 
other residents of the area reported seeing lights and UFOs in the sky. Around the same time, the Lilly family in Point Pleasant told John A. Keel that they had seen strange lights in the sky and experienced poltergeist activity inside their home. One night, their daughter Linda awoke to see a large man looming over her, with a wide grin on his face. Linda said about this meeting, A man, a big man, very broad. I couldn't see his face very well, but I could see that he was grinning at me. He walked around the bed and stood right over me. I screamed again and hid under the covers. When I looked again, he was gone. Thus the legend of the Grinning Man was born, fueled by the fact that Cold's visits to Derenberger continued over the months, even involving family members who said they had met Indrid Cold several times during the winter of 1967. Cold was an entity or being that according to their accounts would be peaceful, polite and genuinely interested in their lives. But the excessive media exposure due to the case did not bring anything good to the family. In fact, for years, they received harassing phone calls from anonymous people who discredited their story and over time they were accused of having invented the whole story to become rich and famous. Woodrow also suffered a nervous breakdown, went into psychiatric treatment and although the doctors ascertained his good mental health, his obsession with the figure of cold became too stressful and finally his wife decided to divorce him. Woodrow Derenberger isolated himself from his loved ones and later left West Virginia to try to build another life. He only returned to the Mineral Wells area in 1990 at the age of 74. After more than 20 years, he never retracted his testimony. Brian Dunning, author of Skeptoid magazine, analyzing the story, limited himself to saying that it's difficult to tell if it really happened, but it's clear that Derenberger gained nothing from coming forward. His obsession with it cost him his job and his wife. In the field of extraterrestrial creatures, the next type entered common imagination just 30 years ago, thanks to the studies carried out by a small group of ufologists. In fact, they argue that in some cases of close encounters or alien abductions, the beings would have an appearance similar to that of insects, in most cases that of mantises, that would vary in size and height. In the classification of alien races elaborated by the ufologist Brad Steiger, the insectoids would belong to the so-called Delta type. Before the 1990s, the only alien insectoid generally cited by ufologists was the Mothman. However, over the years, other types of insectoids have also entered ufological literature. It all began in 1992, during a conference on alleged alien abductions held at MIT, where the psychologist Brian Thompson, a researcher on the phenomenon of alien abductions, told the story of a little girl who in 1957, after the sighting of a UFO in the skies of Cincinnati, saw an alien about 10 inches tall, roaming the countryside, and though it was bipedal, it had a face similar to that of a mantis. Later, the psychiatrist Carla Turner, also a researcher on the phenomenon of alien abductions, in her book Into the Fringe, reported the case of a man called David, who during a session of regressive hypnosis remembered being abducted by aliens similar to mantises. But the greatest scholar of these peculiar cases of close encounters is undoubtedly the journalist and writer Linda Moulton Howe, who in the book Glimpses of Other Realities reported some alleged encounters with insectoid aliens looking like large anthropomorphic mantises. The two most famous cases feature Linda Porter and David Huggins as protagonists, who reported to Howe that they had been abducted by alien insectoids when they were children, and that they only remembered the abduction in 1988, following regressive hypnosis sessions. Although fewer in number, encounters with alleged insectoid aliens have also been reported outside the United States of America, many of which occurred in Canada, 
where the abductees in question, just like their US counterparts, speak of mantis-like, or grasshopper-like, aliens. Over time, various ideas and assumptions about this alleged type of aliens have developed in the context of conspiracy theories, which are often reported without precise sources to support them. An example is provided by Riley Martik, who in the book The Coming of Tan stated that in a spaceship in orbit around Saturn there would be representatives of seven alien races, including a race of insectoids, the so-called Screed. Through regressive hypnosis sessions, several abductees by this particular alien race spoke in depth about their civilization, describing in detail their history and their planet of origin. The mantis race would be a type of insectoid that lives on a semi-arid planet, similar to a terrestrial desert. It is thought that this race comes from the constellation of Scorpio or from that of Virgo, while the planet where they live would be mostly flat and with few noteworthy mountain ranges. There are also some particular forms of plant life, but they are very sporadic and survive thanks to the alkaline soil, in which there is a lot of salinity. Apparently, in ancient times, the planet was covered in water, which slowly dried up due to the intense activity of the sun, which is why mantises do not need much water to survive. Instead, they need salt, which they find in enormous quantities all over the planet. Their sun, almost a third larger than ours, allowed their planet a consistent development, so much so that it was covered almost entirely with salt water, contained in vast oceans. Following the instability of the star, the planet overheated, creating a greenhouse effect similar to what is thought to have occurred on Venus, but allowing the planet to remain warm enough for the survival of life forms. Most of the water evaporated, creating vast deposits of salt. The rest was instead absorbed by the ground. One of the few forms of life that survived is that of the mantis. Once aquatic beings, they then evolved into terrestrials, with a sort of biological cycle extended over millions of years, similar to that which occurs on a smaller scale with mosquitoes, between their larval passage in water until complete maturation in the air. Their civilization developed over millions of years, and according to the contactees, today there are three different types of mantises. The first, the most common and well-known, with a green skin, a second with brown skin, and finally the third, which is at the top of the hierarchy of power, that of the white mantises. The shortest mantises measure two meters in height, in rare cases even less. The tallest can even reach 20 feet in height, therefore their average height measures between 10 and 12 feet. They don't have real cities in which they live, rather an underground network of tunnels. The tunnels and agglomerations are dug into the sandy soil and deeper into the rock, and they are similar to anthills, but obviously gigantic and on an almost planetary scale. They extend beneath almost the entire planet, connecting different, let's call them, colonies. Obviously, these are only theories and stories that do not involve any tangible proof of the existence of an extraterrestrial civilization. In fact, according to some proponents of the psychosocial hypothesis of UFOs, the phenomenon of insectoid aliens would be explained by the influence of cultural factors, above all related to pop culture and the boom of the sci-fi genre in the 1950s. For example, the psychologist Martin Kottmeyer pointed out that giant mantises were the protagonists of films such as The Deadly Mantis in 1957 and Son of Godzilla in 1968. An alien mantis named Zorak instead appeared in the well-known children's show Space Ghost, broadcast in 1966 in the United States. Grasshopper-shaped aliens appeared in the film Quartermass and the Pit, based on the 1958 television series of the same name. Before the insectoids entered the scene, 
a theory made its way into ufology that saw as its protagonists beings with physical characteristics similar to that of another animal form present on planet Earth. In fact, in relation to stories of UFO sightings and close encounters, it has been claimed in several cases that the aliens took the form of humanoid reptiles. In the classification of extraterrestrial races, they too, like mantises, belong to the so-called Delta type. Several conspiracy theories, especially those developed in the 1990s, support the supposed existence of reptilian bloodlines on Earth. According to these theories, the aliens are supposed to come from the Draco constellation. While John Rhodes, in his opinion, maintains that humanoid reptiles descend from dinosaurs, and in support of his study, he cites Dale Russell's theory, which explains how some species of dinosaurs had survived the meteorite that crashed in the Yucatan, finding shelter inside enormous caves, such as Hang Son Dun, the largest cave known to man and discovered just 30 years ago in Vietnam. The cave is so large that it can contain an entire New York City block inside, and although it is only 490 feet wide, it is 5.6 miles long and 660 feet high. Inside there is a functioning ecosystem, complete with meteorological events, such as the formation of clouds and rainfall. The Hang Son Dung was formed between 2 to 5 million years ago, and according to the legends of the local populations, humanoid creatures with the skin and face of a snake would live inside it, in its most profound depths. Stories such as this led Rhodes to state that human attention was deliberately shifted from the underworld to outer space, and it was precisely to keep matters concerning subterranean peoples and the purported habitats of their ancient civilization secret, within the Hollow Earth theory. According to David Icke, in his book The Biggest Secret, the book that will change the world, the reptilian humanoids would be an occult force that manipulates and controls humanity. The race consists of six-foot-tall, blood-drinking beings who can shapeshift. They come from the Alpha Draconis system and rule the Earth through their shape-shifting abilities. According to Ike, examples of reptilians impersonating humans include the British royal family, Bill and Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Paul Shockley, founder of the Aquarius Universal Service Church, believes he is an individual who can channel cosmic awareness. Through what he calls a disclosure of consciousness, he has reported the existence of a dangerous race of reptiles, some of which, however, may be benevolent individuals. The cosmic awareness will lead him to affirm that even some human beings contain reptilian DNA. But the first witness in history who reported the alleged existence of reptilians was Herbert Shermer, who told for the first time of a reptilian extraterrestrial being. He claimed to having been abducted by humanoids with reptilian skin and faces. Ashland, Nebraska, December 3, 1967. At 2.30 a.m., police officer Herbert Shermer was driving on Highway 6, intent on his patrol, when he saw some reddish lights on Highway 63 in the distance. Assuming it could be a truck that had stopped due to a technical failure, he decided to approach. As he approached it, he illuminated the object with his headlights. Herbert immediately realised that it was not a truck at all, but rather a metal-surfaced, disc-shaped craft hovering about 10 feet above the road. The disc swayed slightly from left to right and emitted reddish lights from what Shermer described as portholes. Amazed and at the same time worried, the agent didn't feel like getting out of his vehicle, so consequently he limited himself to watching the disc, which, after a few moments, began to slowly gain altitude, while from some nozzles placed under its hull, copious flames were expelled. The aircraft began to emit an annoying sound similar to a police siren, and after passing over Shermer's car, it disappeared from his sight, 
reaching surprising speed in an instant. Still in disbelief, Shermer grabbed a flashlight, got out of the car and went to the spot where he had seen the UFO. The asphalt did not appear to show any type of alteration, nor were there any other signs that could provide further confirmation in relation to the presence of the disc. He therefore decided to go back to the station, where he wrote these exact words in his report. Saw a flying saucer at the junction of Highway 6 and 63. Believe it or not. At this point, Shermer realised that it was already 3 in the morning, and this was a great surprise to him, given that the sighting seemed to him to have lasted no more than 10 minutes, and the time to return to the station could absolutely not have been more than 20 minutes. However, given his tiredness, Shermer went home to go to sleep, but when he woke up, he found he had a slight headache, which, as the hours went by, increased more and more. In addition to this annoying headache, Shermer claimed to hear a strange buzzing, and furthermore, he realised that he had an inexplicable red mark on his neck, just below his ear. The same day, the director of the county police, Bill Vlaskin, went to the place indicated by Shermer, where he found a small piece of metal, which subsequent analysis revealed to be composed of iron and silicon. However, no one was able to establish what the object was. In those years, the Condon Committee created in 1966 by the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board and directed by the famous physicist Edward Condon was investigating the UFO phenomenon at the University of Boulder, Colorado. Some of its members heard of Shermer's sighting and subsequent physical problems, so they contacted him and suggested that he undergo regressive hypnosis to try to bring out aspects of the experience that had been repressed or which he was not aware of. Shermer accepted, and on February 13th, 1968, a session of regressive hypnosis was performed under the supervision of the famous psychologist and researcher Leo Sprinkle of the University of Wyoming. During hypnosis, Shermer said he saw lights in the distance and approached them, thinking it was a broken down truck. According to what was narrated to Dr. Sprinkle, in fact, Shermer would have tried to contact the sheriff as soon as he became aware of the anomalous nature of the object in the road, but the radio stopped working, as if the aircraft itself had interfered with its functioning. However, it is what follows that turns out to be totally different from what Shermer was aware of in a conscious state. In fact, still under hypnosis, Shermer said that two humanoid beings descended from the aircraft and approached his car. One of the two, in the dim light, took out a device that produced a thick greenish fog which enveloped the car in a few seconds. At the same time, it was as if Shermer was immobilised by a strange, invisible force. The other figure approached him and attached a small silvery object right under his ear, which made him feel a spinning sensation. As a result, as if teleported, he found himself inside the alien craft. Thanks to the greater luminosity of the craft, Shermer was able to better see his captors. Six feet in height, eyes similar to those of cats and without lids, lizard skin of a light greenish-grey colour, thin and elongated faces. They were wearing silvery overalls, with gloves and helmet, on which, like a standard, there was the emblem of a winged serpent. The one who seemed to be in command of the flying saucer spoke telepathically to Shermer, revealing a series of information about their identity. The members of this extraterrestrial race would have come to visit the Earth a long time ago, and that disk in particular was extracting energy from some electricity poles present in the area. The functioning of the spacecraft would have been linked to the use of reversible magnetism. Shermer was shown screens showing images of other star systems and motherships, which disks, identical to the one on which he had been transported, detached from. The captain also introduced him to the crew members, one of whom told him that they would see him again two more times in the future, but this didn't happen. In the centre of the room was a similar screen showing the star system where the aliens said they came from. Furthermore, according to the extraterrestrials, the galaxy in question is close to ours, 
but has suns and planets that Shermer was unable to decipher. Following what was said in a conscious state and what emerged during the first hypnosis, the experts had conflicting opinions on the whole story. The only element which both the members of the Condon Committee and Professor Sprinkle agreed on was that Agent Shermer really believed in his experience. It was absolutely not an invented story concocted in order to try to obtain a little fame. Fame which, moreover, did not arrive at all. Indeed, on the contrary, Shermer began to be the object of ridicule by the Ashland community, to the point of being publicly mocked, thus losing any credibility and authority. The Condon Committee concluded that, the lack of any evidence and interviews with the patrolmen left project staff with no confidence that the troopers reported UFO experience was physically real. Professor Sprinkle was more lenient, declaring that Shermer certainly believed he had really lived the incident he had reported. Shermer, not fully satisfied with the results obtained, underwent further sessions of regressive hypnosis in the following years at the office of Dr. Ron Katz of the University of California, during which he made various drawings of what he saw that night of December the 3rd, 1967. Over the years, proponents of the psychosocial UFO hypothesis believe that cultural reasons underpin conspiracy theories about reptilians. Fear of reptiles is atavistic and is also found in certain mythologies and legends. Furthermore, science fiction may have greatly contributed to the development of conspiracy theories about the existence of these reptilians. Skeptic Brian Dunning suggests that a 1943 article in the Los Angeles Times may have also given rise to such beliefs. In the article, a geophysicist and mining engineer announced that he had discovered an underground labyrinth beneath the city of Los Angeles. It would lead to an underground city, built by an advanced race of lizard men some 5,000 years ago, to escape a catastrophe that occurred on the surface of the planet. The man's name was George Warren Schufelt, and he was a geologist and mining engineer in Los Angeles. He was also a lover of buried treasure and an avid collector of Native American legends. In the summer of 1933, Schufelt met an old Hopi leader whose traditional name was Greenleaf. The man told him many details about his culture and the danger of its disappearance. But during these meetings, he also told Schufelt a legend, which the engineer immediately reconstructed in his own way. Based on this legend, relating to the virtue of the Hopi warriors, and in particular of one of their tribes, whose members were called lizards, Schufelt concluded that the Hopi knew of an ancient lizard people, who apparently lived in caves beneath present-day Los Angeles. At that point, the man started turning the story into modern mythology, adding all kinds of elements that were at their peak in American mass culture in those years. And so the Hopi warriors of the lizard tribe turned into reptilian men, the last survivors of a super race that was nearly wiped out in a meteor shower 5,000 years ago. Schufelt used to tell that they had created very advanced intellectual and technological communities. Moreover, they possessed chemicals that could quickly dig huge underground tunnels where for thousands of years they managed to survive and hide from us human beings. Schufelt stated that there are 285 tunnels and a series of huge caverns under Los Angeles, each inhabited by a thousand families of lizards. He also asserted that there were many treasures in the tunnels, a real reptilian El Dorado to be claimed, as, always according to his stories, all the reptilian inhabitants of the underground caverns had become extinct due to the deadly gases that penetrated the Earth's cavities. However, although Schufelt tried for years to obtain funds to excavate underground in search of the lost treasure of the reptilians, no investor came forward, and with the outbreak of World War II, the story of the reptilian civilization in the underground of Los Angeles ended up in oblivion. Even if, over time, thanks to this story, 
the archetype of the reptilians was fixed in our collective imagination. The Nordic or Pleiadian aliens, from their presumed origin in the Pleiades, are together with the Greys and the reptilians among the most widespread populations in the ufological world. Close encounters with these entities have been reported mainly in Europe, especially in the north of the continent and in the United Kingdom. They would have humanoid shape and characteristics, so as to be indistinguishable from humans themselves. In particular, they would have light-coloured skin, light blue or slightly elongated albino eyes, blonde hair and would be five to six feet tall. Thanks to their particular physical characteristics, many say that in the past these creatures would have been mistaken for divine entities, entering the collective imagination in various forms, including as angels and divine messengers. According to several contactees, in the Pleiades cluster there are about 50 star systems, inhabited and colonised by the Pleiadians, who are mainly divided into two large lineages. The first lineage has a classic Nordic appearance, the second is similar to the Middle Eastern ethnicity, however they are less common in reports of close encounters. These beings would always be positive and bearers of peace, as well as protection against other malevolent aliens, such as the Greys and the Reptilians. The hypothesis of the existence of this type of alien was first advanced in the 1950s by the ufologist and alleged contactee George Adamski. Adamski claimed to have encountered these creatures numerous times in Arizona starting from November the 20th 1952 and to have known that these aliens would live hidden among humans, blending in with northern European populations. Adamski's contact would have been called Orthon and according to him would have been of Venusian origin, not Pleiadian. Also, in the late 1950s, the English contactee, Cynthia Appleton, also claimed that the father of her son Matthew would have been an alien from Venus. While the first real testimony relating to a Nordic who arrived on Earth from the Pleiades is thanks to the Swiss ufologist Billy Mayer, who claimed to have had, at the end of the 70s, some contacts with female exponents of this alien ethnic group. One in particular, called Semjaze, would have revealed to him that they originated from the Pleiades, more specifically from the constellation of Taurus. The discordant stories relating to the origin of this civilization led several ufologists to theorize that this population would have originated on Venus, from orbiting stations, or from the planet itself, but before its ecological destruction, when it was still habitable. While according to some ufological currents, it would be the descendants of alleged ancient astronauts who would have colonised remote planets. And finally, there are those who speak of an alleged planet X within our solar system. In this vein, we can find the research of Zechariah Sitchin, a Russian acerologist who claims to have found references to our progenitor alien ethnic group in the Sumerian tablets. The Anunnaki, from the planet Nibiru, of our solar system, which according to some would also be Pleiadian entities. The last beings we are going to talk about are the most famous and well known all over the world. The so-called Greys, also known as Zeta, Gize or Reticulani, based on their star system of origin Zeta Reticuli. They are the type of intelligent extraterrestrial life that appears most frequently in reports of close encounters, and particularly in reports of abduction. In the Stainer classification, they would correspond to alpha-type aliens. The greys are generally described as short, slender, completely hairless, grey-skinned humanoids, with large heads, huge black pupilless eyes, and small, often lipless, mouths. Some have noted in this a strong resemblance to human infants, that is, they would resemble adult men with infantile characteristics. Others have compared the appearance of the greys to that of fetuses. According to the studies of several contactees, it is assumed that they possess reproductive and digestive systems.
The most widespread theory is that they are created through a process of cloning by means of genetic engineering, and being a very ancient race, they would have reproduced for thousands of years using this technique. The alleged planet of the Greys, Zeta Reticuli, would have a high rate of radioactivity due to the proximity to its sun and has therefore become uninhabitable on its surface. This extreme proximity to the star would have evolutionarily led them to have a double eyelid, one external and one internal to the eye, to bear enormous quantities of light. The ultimate goal of the Greys on Earth would be to genetically find cures for the diseases that ravage Zeta Reticuli and from which the Greys are seriously affected. According to conspiracy theories based on revelations made by alleged former insiders such as Bill Cooper, John Lear and Philip Schneider, in February 1954 the USA established contact with a race of aliens called Greys who landed at Muroc Airfield, now renamed Edwards Air Base, and they would have met with President Eisenhower. Later, members of the American government decided to enter into a treaty with these alien entities. This treaty was called the Greada Treaty, which basically originated the agreement that aliens could take some livestock and test their implant techniques on some humans. In return, the human guinea pigs would not have developed any memory of what happened to them, and the aliens would have provided a list of all the people taken to the secret government office called Majestic 12. In addition to this, the Greys would provide the United States with advanced technology that would aid its scientific development, thus making the nation a true superpower. It was finally agreed that underground bases would be built that the aliens could use for their own ends, and that in two of these bases there would be an exchange of scientific information between the Greys and the US government. The first case of alien abduction involving the Greys was that of Mr and Mrs Hill. On the night of September the 19th, 1961, the young couple, originally from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, were driving along the state road in the White Mountains when suddenly their car was enveloped in a blinding light. A few moments passed and the light that enveloped them went out. There was a blackout in the minds of the protagonists. It was ten in the evening when the car set off again. The tension between the two was skyrocketing and Barney wanted to leave that narrow and isolated mountain road as soon as possible. Returning home at dawn, the two immediately realised that the time elapsed was too much for a journey that would normally last two hours. Over the next few days, they suffered severe migraines, and after about ten days, Betty was the victim of frightening nightmares. She dreamt of being subjected to surgical examinations inside a room by doctors with grotesque somatic traits different from human ones. The couple then decided to undergo regressive hypnosis and their memories began to resurface from their minds. A light from the sky, a flying saucer, strange grey-skinned beings and invasive medical tests with science fiction type equipment. These details form part of the account that Barney and Betty gave of that night. After several sessions of regressive hypnosis, Betty managed to identify a clear identikit of their captors, and thus for the first time, the world became aware of the Greys. Harvard Medical School professor John Edward Mack says many of his abduction patients have had close encounters with Grey-like aliens. In his books, Abduction and Passport to the Cosmos, he describes their experiences, claiming that such contacts spiritually transformed his patients by momentarily elevating them to a higher level of consciousness. Neurologist Stephen Novella, supporter of the psychosocial UFO hypothesis, believes that the greys are a product of the human imagination and that their somatic features, while not human, represent what modern humans psychologically associate with intelligence. The Greys are also the extraterrestrials described in the aforementioned 1987 novel Communion by Whitley Stryber. 
in which the author narrates alleged alien abduction experiences in the first person. However, the writer claims that the Greys are not real extraterrestrials. Stryber has formulated several unusual hypotheses regarding their origin, such as that the Greys are nothing more than physical manifestations of the human subconscious. Occultist Alistair Crowley claimed to have made contact with beings referred to as Enochian angels, which according to some ufologists show similarities to the Greys. Some supporters of the Hollow Earth theory believe that greys live in a continent located under the Earth's surface and that their physical appearance, eyes and skin colour is indicative of a biological evolution that took place in an environment with little light. Another theory is that they are time travellers. In practice, the greys would be human beings of the future who went back in time with UFOs, that would be their time machines, and their bodies have evolved with the passing of the centuries. The greys have also appeared in the so-called alien autopsies, which caused a sensation in the 90s by appearing on all the major television networks worldwide. The first and best known of these autopsy recordings was the so-called Santilli film, which documentary filmmaker Ray Santilli claimed to have purchased from a former military cameraman. The film should have been an original from 1947, relating to the famous UFO incident in Roswell, New Mexico. But it was immediately branded as a fake, both by members of the UFO community and by many experts in various sectors who detected inconsistencies and anachronisms in objects present in the scene. Obviously, many ufologists claim that those who claim the video is fake were paid by Majestic 12, according to standard debunking procedure. Yet another turning point in the case occurred in April 2006, when John Humphreys, creator of the Max Headroom series, claimed to be the creator of the puppets used in the film, calling it all a joke, or even a scam, given the large sums earned from the sale of the film to TV stations all over the world. John even revealed that he also appeared in the video in the role of the surgeon, According to him, the footage was shot in early 1995 in a flat in the Camden district of London. Here ends our journey to discover these entities that for over 70 years have entered our folklore and stories of humanity, as once witches, ghosts or goblins did. Today our curiosity for the inexplicable is focused on looking up to the skies or into the depths of the earth, to discover once again, as in the past, if there are hidden beings capable of revealing truths that we are not yet capable of knowing.